Okay, so when you're in the feast state, plenty of energy. Uh, lipids are often made. <laughs> They're not, I mean, if you take in excess calories, regardless of where they come from, you're going to make fat with them. That's, that's your biochemistry, all right? So I said when you have plenty of glucose, the acetylcholase generated by glycolysis can be converted into fatty acids, triglycerides, cholesterol, steroids, and bile salts. All right, so this is kind of getting you, here we, get, we got to our acetyl-CoA's, right? And we've got all these different options for this. So again, the point being that when you have plenty, right, of energy, these, this acetyl-CoA, this molecule is a starting point to get to a lot of other, right? I see it here and here to get us into a lot of other larger molecules. We can just begin putting them together building. All right, I said generally this occurs in the adipocytes and hepatocytes. So I do tell students that if we're talking about something related to um, metabolism, your targets are skeletal muscle, liver, and fat. All right, so protein metabolism. All right, we, we took in all these varieties of different proteins and we started the chemical breakdown of those in the digestive process in the stomach. We did a lot of it in the small intestine right, with uh, the assistance of especially cholecystokinin telling the pancreas to produce all these different, right, substances, secretin telling it to make bicarbonate. And this made the environment right, and we basically chopped up, right, our proteins into, um, almost into amino acids, to very small peptides. We then had some peptidases that the intestinal cells made, and they finally finished it up, right? So we have amino acids, and amino acids then would come into our blood. So I remind you that proteins make up much of the cell, all right? They are, and therefore the body, because we are cellular in nature. It takes a variety of forms and functions. You know, at least 200,000 different proteins are made by the human body. Uh, and even with all this, it can be used as fuel, energy, all right? Proteins are not stored for later use. They are converted. So proteins either become some... Think something like hemoglobin, elastin, right, collagen, right, actin, myosin, or they are reorganized into a glucose molecule or into a fat if we're going to store the energy in them, right? Food is an important so source of our, for us of these amino acids because there are a number of essential amino acids. And that means that you and your body can't make them. You must get them from your diet. So you have to have some consumption of proteins. All right. So the fates of the amino acids. Okay. We left off again with all that digestive process on the previous slide. So um, absorbed through active transport. Um, many are used to make proteins fulfill all the different functions of the body. As I said, that was really first introduced in AMP1 back in chapter three when we talked about cells. If there's an excess in the blood, they do become glucose, they become ketones, um, and different metabolic intermediates. <clears throat> they do, in the process of using these, we do produce a toxic waste product, ammonia, and then this is a problem we have to deal with. And ammonia gets converted to urea, so we talk about the urea cycle in the liver and kidneys, which processes ammonium molecule, or ion, into urea, and then allows for its elimination. So. Here again, we're looking at a lot of chemistry and chemical changes that can occur that you don't have to know. Um, this is a take home message here, but, but that does let you know this is all a bunch of chemical reactions. All right, here's what you can do with the proteins when you need energy. You're in the famine state, okay? So this shows you the, glu the glucogenic amino acids. So these, you don't have to know them specifically, but know that uh, some amino acids can be used to make new glucose, right? These all can be converted to a pyruvate and then pyruvate can be used to put a glucose together. Because again, you have to maintain glucose levels. Um, here's the ones that are made into ketone bodies, right? Which can be then converted back to a acetyl-CoA and used for energy, all right? Um, here are the ones that, and here's roles where they specifically, these two can be made into acetic acid, so used again in Krebs cycle. And these ones as ketoglutyric acid, these ones as succinyl, and these ones as fumarate. So all of your 20 different amino acids can have some contribution to your energy needs 
if you again are in a famine state. So I said you have many enzymes and reversible metabolic pathways that control energy flow. So this is again the big picture again in a very very simple cartoon this time. All right, catabolic reactions to release, and again they've color coded this, and anabolic reactions to store this. So reversible. That's why you see the arrows going in different directions, all in for the intent of maintaining the body's needs, right? And as I showed you in the beginning, you have the blue to show us these catabolic reactions and the light green is showing you the idea of anabolic. So when there's plenty of energy, store it. And each arrow, again, represents many different chemical reactions you now realize. And, and just again, this is what allows you to have such a diverse diet and um, allows you to survive in many different places as well, ultimately, because you can find something to eat and something you can use for energy and you can use for building blocks. All right, so now in this part of the, the chapter, we're, we're looking at, again, the idea of specifically the feast and famine. So absorptive versus post-absorptive. So this is the terms we use for this as well. So you do not eat at all times, but you need energy always. Right, this is this is not an assumption, this is a reality. Decisions are made mostly by the liver. I said muscle, especially skeletal muscle, and adipose tissue when it comes down to metabolic reactions. I have called this feast and famine, we are now called absorptive and post absorptive. So right, so you've got your post absorptive would be your famine state. Your feast state is your absorptive. I said the absorptive can be four hours long, starts after you eat. And anabolism, so the synthesis reactions, will exceed the breakdown reactions. I mentioned here's what's going on. Rising glucose levels stimulate insulin in the absorptive and feast states, which cause liver, adipose, and muscle to take up glucose, convert this to glycogen, and triglycerides. All right? So a nice, oh, really cool cartoon, really, to emphasize what's going on here in this absorptive state. So again, here's your digestive nutrients, uh, shown as different symbols. Right, which is kind of cool here, right? Um, insulin produced by the pancreas as it senses this, right? And that allows cells in the body to start taking up, especially glucose. So you see glucose levels. And um, we're gonna then direct some of the nutrients to adipose, some of the nutrients to, to muscle, and some to liver. And, and, and again, liver would deal with really all of them, right? The fat would be very good here for lipids and glucose. I get under the influence of insulin. You see insulin's role as this highly anabolic hormone here. And this kind of walks you through the details. All right, post-absorptive. So between your meals and overnight, right, when you're not eating, um, then catabolic reactions are very important. And we call this again the post-absorptive state. Here's the situation. Glucose is dropping. And so glucagon becomes active. Liver will stop storing energy, start breaking down glycogen and releasing glucose. Liver will also start gluconeogenesis using amino acids and glycerol to make glucose as we saw in the previous pathways. Muscle will use glycogen and fatty acids for its fuel and adipose will release fatty acids to become ketones to fuel the body. All right, so here's our again post-absorptive state without nutrients entering the blood system and of course glucagon becomes your dominant here and what is the fate then well we're going to start releasing as you see leaving the cells it's been stored release it back out in each case glycogen glycogen and ketone oxidation would increase right so really nice simple cartoon now energy and heat balance all right so we have to so this would be your caloric balance basically what you take in you use and heat, of course, is a form of energy, right? So heat is the final product, or it's, it's not the final product. It's, it's always produced. Heat is always produced when energy is transferred from one form to another. And this heat, of course, is the lowest form of energy, and it is not usable. So it can't bring about change or have the capacity to work in that sense. It's just, it, it dissipates from things. It moves away from them. Well, for us as mammals, we utilize this heat. So the heat that came out of those calories, um, that potential energy, which we recovered about 40, maybe 40% 40 of the potential energy, the rest of it became heat and heat 
maintains our internal environment, which we call thermoregulation. So again, here we say we only capture about 40% of the energy to make ATP, the rest becomes heat, and this maintains our bodies. Temperature is a homeostatic constant, and the hypothalamus is very important for regulating this. So we give the scenario of right, body temperature is low, body temperature is high. And we should have talked about this several times in AAP1, including in the skin. Um, and I mentioned it briefly when we talked about endocrine here because thyroid hormones are important in regulating this as well. So this is actually showing the hypothalamus in both cases as being sensitive to this change and the hypothalamus directing, all right, and ultimately restoring balance. All right, so um, I said, 84 degrees Fahrenheit is actually what we call thermoneutral. Most of the time, you're not, we're not there. So this is when the, in the environment, 84 degrees Fahrenheit. So how many days in Texas are we right at 84 degrees Fahrenheit? So you really are in this, generally in this state of either trying to derive heat or lose heat to your environment. So, you know, again, I shouldn't say derive it from your, but you're trying to maintain your internal temperature in spite of your environment, really. So four mechanisms drive heat from warmer areas to cooler areas. You probably heard this in physical science, conduction, radiation, convection, right, evaporation. So conduction, just straight definition, direct contact between objects, right? So you sitting in the chair you are in right now, listening to this or wherever you are, if you got up, that would be warm. You have lost or transferred some of your heat to that object. And we say about 3% of your heat is lost this way. Convection, this is the transfer of the heat um, to air or water, and this moves away and is replaced by cooler air, so it's a little bit more effective. Um, this kind of saturates early on, so 15% of your heat is lost this way. Evaporation, um, this changes the state of water from liquid to gas, and because that takes a lot of energy, then you've really got a 20% loss of heat this way. All right, and then radiation is the main way. So we've kind of ranked this three, right, percent, 15, 20. Radiation is a transfer between objects and 60% of your heat is lost this way. It just moves from you to the world around you, all right? That's radiation. And that's, of course, how we receive um, energy from the sun through radiation and including the heat. All right, metabolic rate. Well, this is something that you guys have been calculating on your nutrition or diet summary, what I call your nutrition recall, but it's really your diet summary. So metabolic rate, amount of energy consumed, measured in calories, the amount expended, measured in calories, right? So your basal metabolic rate, so this would be balance if these were equal, okay? Basal metabolic rate is what I call the cost of living, all right? It is the amount of energy used at rest in a neutrally temperate environment, so again, temperature somewhere around 84, uh, post-absorptive, so the state you're in metabolically is important and this ends up being about 70 percent of your caloric needs so this should be really the highest number when we consider um, all the numbers on your your recalls it of course is affected by age um, as you get older your metabolic rate declines amount and types of body tissue yes if you have more muscle it's higher costs higher to maintain it than it does fats hormones yep Thyroxins, levels of thyroxin and triiodothyronine affect your metabolic rate, your basal metabolic rate. But the average human needs between, needed, needs between 1,500 and 2,500 calories. Uh, then, so this was 70, so the rest of your needs come from, or you know, the rest of your caloric needs are due to additional physical activity, right, which is not that much more, but it's still, and this can vary. And then, of course, your regulation of body temperature. All right, we'll pick up with nutrition and diet on the next video, and hopefully, again, this is starting to make sense. It's a lot about us and stuff you can relate to.